All right, wait for us slow pokes. All right, Daniel 7, verse 1. Now we've gone through the first half of the book, which was all the miracles of God. I mean, how God delivered the, the, the Hebrew boys and how God gave them, made their fa face look fatter, fleshed, and they didn't eat the king's meat nor drink his wine, and how that they were fairer. We saw how God delivered Daniel out of the lion's den and what a type of Christ it was. Amen. Good to see Lisa here this morning. Praise the Lord. She's been sick and up in and out of just fighting the flu or whatever, the colds, and thank God she's here. And uh, we're all here, amen, by the grace of God. And so uh, we've seen for six chapters, the Lord wanted us to see his power. And now he's going to begin to unfold prophecies. 7 through 12 are going to be some of the greatest prophecies of the Bible. And some of the more detailed prophecies, even more than Revelation. When you get over to uh, Daniel 11, it's going to talk about King of the South and how he's going to work and how he's going to deceive. And uh, very, f it fills in a lot of blanks. In Revelation, you get a lot of truth. But they're two companion books. So if you're going to study Revelation, you want to study Daniel. And if you're going to study Daniel, you're going to keep going. You're going to go back and forth to Revelation because there's details from each book. But in chapter 7, he begins, this is interesting, Daniel now gets a dream. And before it was Nebuchadnezzar getting dreams. He dreamed of a tree and he, you know, and it's, you know, branches covered the beasts of the earth. He dreamed of a, a, a great image where, whose head was gold. And so Daniel had to interpret the dreams. But now God is giving Daniel a dream about the future to interpret for all of us and how that affects our lives. Because those dreams that Nebuchadnezzar had affected him in his time. But these dreams are going to affect the silent years all the way to the time of Christ's coming in the millennial age. And so uh, we're going to start in verse 1 here. And it says, uh, this happened... And now, we, interesting enough, we got to Darius in chapter five, 6, where God destroyed uh, Belshazzar because of his sin and the handwriting on the wall, the story there. But then uh, came in Darius in chapter 6, where they made him sign a decree, and they threw Daniel in the lion's den. But then the Lord reverts back to Belshazzar's time again, because he was before Darius. And it, so it says that in the year, in the first year of Belshazzar, so he's reverting back to the king of Babylon, the first kingdom. The king of Babylon, Daniel, uh, had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So he had to write it down. You ever get up in the morning and you had a dream? And if you don't write it down, <laughs> if you... You go like three, a minute later, you're like, what was that dream? Sometimes you're having a really good dream, and you wake up, and you go get a drink of water, you come back, I want to get back, wait, what was that dream? I can't remember the dream. That's the way dreams are. They fly away. So the Lord said, write it down. You know, it's good to write things down, amen? Because you forget. We forget. God gave us a Bible, amen? Thank God we don't even have to depend on dreams today and visions by people in the church. We have something that never changes. It's written down. God said, write these things in a book. And that's what we have. We don't have to forget. We don't have to guess. It's, it's written. So he wrote it down and told the sum of the matters. So he didn't understand it right away either. And so when you see told the sum of the matters, he actually has to ask an angel about, I don't know, verse 15 there. He's going to say, I don't understand what I dreamed. Hey, you over there. It's like I asked one standing by. He gets an angel. He says, can you tell me what I just dreamed? I don't even understand this stuff. So he begins, it's like Jesus, when he would speak to his apostles, he'd tell them a parable. He says, a sower went forth to sow. And the Lord, they'd say, Lord, we don't understand what you're saying. He's like, all right, the sower is, you know, the Lord. And he goes and being, being, he says, the seed that fell by the wayside is they that were, you know, the, the Satan came by and snatched them up. So the Lord has to explain to us dreams in the Bible and Proverbs. And so Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now those four winds are these next four kingdoms, but they're also uh, connected with the wind. Now there's 
when you talk about the wind, you're looking at a spirit. When you think about what Jesus said to um, Nicodemus by night, he says, uh, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Remember that? Where, where it desires, where it leans. When something lists, it leans to that way. So if the spirit says, I'm moving over, I'm going over here. I'm going to go west. I'm going to work in America. He goes wherever he wants. You can't move the spirit. You can't stop the wind. So the wind is like a spirit. Why? It's invisible. And the Holy Spirit is likened unto the wind. The wind, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit there. And he says, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou canst not know uh, where it cometh and whither it goeth or something to that. So is everyone that is born of what? The Spirit. So he said, we are led by God. And the church is like a, you know, like a boat. It's the wind blows our sail wherever it wants us to go. But there's another one that's likened into the wind, and he's called the prince of the power of the air. So Satan is also a spirit. The spirit that now worketh, it calls him a spirit. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So the holy, the, this is not the Holy Spirit here. These four wind, this wind that's blowing is an ill wind. It's a wind that fights God. And, it, and in the four winds of the heavens strove. So there's strife there. And there's words in the, when you read your Bible, there should be indicative, in, indicative words that tell you it's right or wrong. Like I had a guy preach one time in my church. He, he had a message. Um, uh, I, what's the verse? How's the verse go now? Let me get back in my mind here. It talks about intermediate with all wisdom. Uh, he that... Uh, Uh, does anybody know that verse? Seeketh, and I'm working backwards. Seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Um, out of the way. Um, does anybody? Seeketh and intermeddleth. Through, Through desire, that's it. Through a desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Yeah, and, he, and this guy preached a whole message about how we need to separate ourselves. And we need to seek an intermeddle with all wisdom. <laughs> and, and I said, man, that is so wrong. That, the, he preached the whole message on it. You, you follow what I'm saying? That is not a positive verse. There's nothing positive about that verse. He that separates them, he that, through desire, that is not a good desire. So when you see words in your Bible, they should, they're like red flags. You should study your Bible with that word. There's one word in that whole verse that tells you, beware, warning. Which one is it? That's a, that could be good, though. That could be good. I desire uh, to please thee, O Lord. There's verses that talk about good desire. Amen? What's the key word? Anybody got it? Intermeddleth. There's nothing good about meddling. <laughs> the Bible says, he that... He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh what? A dog by the ears. If you're passing by, you see two men fighting. That's what Moses did. He got in between the Jew and that, that the Egyptian. He ends up killing that Egyptian, buries him in the sand. It wasn't, he meddled. If you ever take, if you get a bulldog, right? And he's mad, he's angry. You grab him by both ears. What are you going to do? If you let go of this hand... He's going to bite this hand. He's going to bite this arm. If you let go of that ear, he's going to bite this arm. So the Bible says, look, if it doesn't belong to you, don't be grabbing two people and try to be the arbiter, arbiter or Russian, the, the, the referee in two other people's conflict. You might pray for it. Yeah, there's, but don't pass by. Just, oh, pass by. So the word is metal. You say, what are we talking about? I thought we were in Daniel. I'm just giving object lessons. When you study the Bible, there are key words in every verse. The Lord put it to show you what the verse is talking about within the context. A text without a uh, context is a pretext. That means preformed ideas. Look at the context and it'll tell you what you should think of it, not you tell it what it should say. Amen? I had another guy preach a message out of, I think, James, where it says, uh, do you think the script or something like thank you the scripture saith in vain uh, the spirit within us lusteth to envy um, well I looked all through my Bible didn't find that where it said the spirit within us lusteth to envy 
The scriptures say that all over the scripture. It doesn't, it's not quoting something. It's just telling you the scriptures tell you that in your spirit there's lust that brings you to envy. Um, so you're not going to find that quote. But I had a guy named Maurice LaPierre come to my church. He preached the whole message how we should, the spirit within us lusteth to envy, and we should envy for the things of God. <laughs> it's hard to follow along a message when somebody's taking a passage and misquoting it and using it for the wrong reason. Amen? Y'all follow along here? Am I, am I off here? Well, there are verses that lead you to see this is not good. This is bad. And so when you see the word intermeddle, that should be an indicator. Through desire, you're intermeddling. That means that's a bad desire. You separate yourself from the way of God, and then you intermeddle with all wisdom. And you don't want to do that. The other one, do you think the scripture saith in vain, uh, the spirit within us lusteth to envy? Well, that's not a good verse of scripture. You don't want to quote that and say, we ought to lust for the things of God. In fact, it's, there's like no passage of scripture where the word lust is a good thing. Amen? Can I get an amen? I mean, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to find the word lust being something good. In fact, the Bible sp says the flesh, what? Lusteth against the spirit. And it does not say in the spirit lusteth against the flesh, does it? It says the, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So the spirit doesn't lust. So back here in Daniel 7, you're looking at types. And it says, and the four great beasts came up from the sea. Well, back in verse 2 it says, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Strife. What is going on in the world today is always contention and strife. The Bible says only by what? Pride cometh contention. Contention is like strife. Envyings, strife. You'll find that in the New Testament. Paul says, are you not carnal uh, to the Corinthians? And he says, you're full of uh, uh, reveling. What does it say? Um, go over there. Let's look in, uh, give you a verse here. Look in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. In verse chapter 3. Um Verse 3, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envies and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? There's strife in this world because of uh, envies and pride. And so uh, there's another thing here. It says, in the, in the four winds upon the sea, look in Isaiah 17. What is the sea? Isaiah 17, verse 12. So he's, he's got a vision. He sees the winds striving upon the sea. Isaiah 17, verse 12. So what we're doing is reverse scripture with scripture. That's how you study your Bible. The Bible defines itself. All the scriptures agree to, with one another. The Bible says, Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas. Into the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters. But God shall rebuke them and they shall flee far, far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind. And like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. It's like a tumbleweed. <laughs> Blow it away. So the Lord, you will see a tumbleweed blowing across the street by a wind. That's going to be like the end when the Lord blows the nations away. And they're like seas, though. Let's go back to Daniel 7. So we're, we're comparing Scripture with Scripture. Daniel 7 says he sees it, the four winds. And those four winds uh, of heaven, of this is the, the not the heaven, the third heaven, but the, where the devil is at, where he's called the prince of the power of the air. And he, they strive upon the great sea, upon men. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And so these are going to be the four kingdoms that now Daniel's going to envision. Now, I'll say right now, Larkin takes the first beast and likens it under Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. So he's already off track. He's off, he's off on his whole assessment of the next four kingdoms. Well, look at verse 17. It can't be Nebuchadnezzar. The interpretation 
It says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. They haven't come up yet. So the first one that we're going to see is not the Babylonian kingdom. It's going to be the Medo Persian kingdom. And so uh, when you read Larkin, he shows you the head of gold and he shows you the lion with eagle's wings lined up. It's not. It, the first one, the, the lion with eagle's wings, is going to be Medo Persian Empire under Darius and Cyrus. Really, the head of the, the lion's head is going to be Darius. Cyrus was his nephew and they had a combined kingdom. So there was one who was ahead and then they had a, like a vice president, Cyrus. And both of them reigned. That's why he had arms of silver, because there was two arms, the right and the left. And it made one kingdom. So here we uh, get the verse. Let's read down to that. Verse 4. The first was like a lion. Now Larkin will say that's Nebuchadnezzar. And it's not. That's Darius and Cyrus. And had eagle's wings. Two wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet of a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now, I'm not sure what all that means. <laughs> Thought about it, studied it. A man's heart. I believe that there's basically some spirits behind each of these because they're called beasts. And uh, they're, they're earthly kingdoms, not the kingdoms of our Lord. So these kingdoms are not the Lord's kingdom. And they're going to be seven heads upon a beast. And you're going to see over in John chapter 17, he says, you know, five are fallen and two are. So these are part of an evil kingdom under Satan. So nonetheless, even though Darius signed a decree and was favorable towards the Jews, and he might have even been a believer in the, in the God of heaven, the kingdom was still wicked. It still wasn't under God's control. It still was the kings of this earth and the rulers of this world under Satan. And so maybe it, it likens it unto a man's heart, and it, but it's still a beast. It's still something that is not converted. It can't be saved. It can't be regenerated. These kingdoms will, can only be destroyed. There's nothing you can do to redeem it. You're not going to bring in the kingdom. They're not going to. That's what they're trying to do with the amillennial position. We're going to convert the whole world. We're going to bring in a kingdom and then Christ will come. Can't happen. They're, they're meant to be destroyed. Amen. You, the Lord's going to destroy all the kingdoms. We're going to see that in this chapter. These are four beasts. They're unclean. They're not clean beasts. They're unclean beasts. But the Lord does give them the heart of a man. There's something good about Cyrus and Darius. They said go back and rebuild the temple. So that might have something to do with that. I don't know. Uh, it was lifted up. I don't know if that's good. It sounds bad to me. When you get lifted up from the earth, uh, generally that's pride. Verse, so that first kingdom is, is uh, the metal Persian, and it's likened with a lion. And the uh, next one is, verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second. These are ones that will come after Belshazzar's kingdom. Another one will come in the future, and that's going to be Greek. That's, good. That's the Greek, Greek empire under Alexander. And behold, another beast, a second like it to a bear. And it raised it up itself. So these are talking about empires coming up. It was dormant for a long time. Ma um, what was his name? Uh, Philip of Macedon, Macedonia. He was the father of Alexander. He united the Greek empire. And his son Alexander became a great king. Brother Tristan. I'm going to actually typify some things here in a minute. We're going to go back and look at some modern kingdoms that line up with these three beasts. And we're going to see the Antichrist. And so, but this one here is Greek. You say, what's the connection? There's a big connection between Greece and Russia. And we'll get to that in a second. I'll go back. I am not want to repeat, repeat it. And it raised up itself on one side. And it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, Un thus unto it arise, devour much flesh. Alexander went from Macedonia all the way to India in a very short time. It's about 333 AD. But his kingdom ended around 322. <laughs> it was very short-lived. It didn't make it, what is that, 
how many years is that, 11 years? 333 down to 322. You're looking at 11 years and then he dies. And his kingdom is going to be divided up. And the, the, the king, the Roman, the, he says each one is diverse from the other. Uh, if you look at it, that's interesting. They have different languages, Medo-Persian. Then you have the Greek. Then you're going to have the Latin. Some of them last very long, like eggs. And then you have the, the, you know, the loins, the Greek, very short. So this bear, he's, he doesn't last very long. He devours real fast, though. Alexander just took down everybody. His army is like a blitzkrieg. <laughs> he just came busting through Asia Minor all the way down to India, and then he dies, they say, of syphilis. And his kingdom is then going to be divided up by four commanders and become the Roman Empire. Basically goes straight from Greek to Roman very quickly after that. Because then you have these four contending king, well, we'll call them kings, generals, Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Antiochus. Ptolemy was in Egypt. Antiochus was in Asia Minor, Italy, uh, Israel, Palestine. Uh, up here in a pl place called Thrace, which is Greece, was um, Lysimachus, and then Macedonia was Cassander. So uh, this whole empire that was you know, quickly absorbed and devoured by Alexander was then broken up. So we get to the next kingdom. And so it's a four-headed one, just like those four generals. After this I beheld and lo another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So this becomes um, the branches from the Greek church. And a man has just... Uh, anatomically, his body, you know, if you're going to study anatomy, uh, four appendages that come off the loins, two legs and his private parts. So what is that? Some were short-lived and two of them lasted longer. Now you have a break at the Roman Empire. You have the Eastern Church and the Western, and you have these two long legs that go all the way down to the toes. And it's called the, the Roman Empire, basically. It had a split in 1054. And the Orthodox Church went east, and the Catholic Church went west. And so going, looking over these three beasts, there's some connections with uh, England, Medo-Persia, the lion. England began uh, basically in modern times to be an empire over all the earth. The sun never set on the British Empire, they'd say, at one point. All around the world, India, and all through Africa. In America, England's sea ships went out and they conquered a great deal of the earth. And so there's a connection there between uh, the lion and Persia. Persia, the England settled that Mideast. They broke up all those tribes and they are actually the ones who designed Iraq, Iran, all these, Jordan. That was all designed by Britain, that Middle East. They had their hand in it and then the Balfour Declaration gave Israel independence, and they got out of the Middle East. But there's a connection between England and the medo persian Empire, Shah of Iran, and the connections with England at the time, and Israel. Britain had a big hand in the Middle East in trying to bring peace, and they couldn't do it. So they just said, we're done. Balfour Declaration gave Israel the land, said you can manage your own land, you have the right to go back, and they didn't go back but until World War II. And then the second one, Brother Tristan aptly connected, was the bear. What you have is the Greek Empire, and there's a bear involved. That's why Russia, Russia uses uh, Greek letters in their alphabet and Cyrillic, but a lot of that was Greek. Their Bible, uh, this is like very closely related with the, the Greek Bible. And so there's a lot of connections between the Orthodox Church and um, Byzantium. Byzantine was the capital of Greece, and the Orthodox Church went up into Russia, not the Catholic Church. So you don't have the the, the Latin rites and the and the uh, what do you call it the the Romance languages. You have a different foundation going to Russia. It's connected with Greece, the West, the Eastern Church, the Eastern rites, icons. They have icons. 
they have pictures of Mary and the little baby. And, they, and the Catholic Church broke from them saying that they didn't believe that you should have, but they have pictures too now, <laughs> icons. But they pray to icons. How many ever hear anything about that? Orthodox Church, Orthodox believers. It was called the iconic, classic controversy. So they had a big split over icons in 1054. So when you go to Russia, you're going to see churches with candles and a lot of pictures of the saints to bow down to. Isn't that right, Lena? Icons, ikoni, vizdia. So they have icons everywhere. And so there's a connection with Russia and Greece and this uh, bear. So, and thirdly, you have uh, another kingdom, and that's uh, going to be the United Nations. That's why the leopard and this third kingdom is going to be uh, the Roman Empire and the European continent. And so what do you find? A leopard. And you find the United Nations under this holy Roman Empire that's going to be revived in these last days. And that becomes the fourth beast. Look at the next verse. And so that's the longest one. I mean, it's going to go for quite some time. In verse 7, this, after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and that's a good study in the Bible, iron. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. Notice it's connected with the feet. <laughs> so what, right away you have ten heads. You have ten, it mentions ten here. Uh, ten horns in, ver, in the verse at the end. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. So ten, ten horns connected with iron. Well, what, what do we see? The iron legs that come down on the image. And so that, those, that kingdom here is connected with Rome, but it goes all the way down to the ten toes. And it stretches from Greek all the way down to these last days. And it becomes the part of the European last kingdom, the United Nations, the ten kings. And so this thing is it's a revival of the Roman Empire with the Pope in power. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 9. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, this is pretty deep material. Um, I'm going against the grain with what a lot of the Bible ta teachers teach. They teach that the lion with wings is Nebuchadnezzar, that the uh, bear is the Medo Persian Empire, the um, leopard with four wings and four heads is the Greek Empire, and then this last one is the Roman Empire. Does anybody know that? Anybody study that? But I'm, I'm teaching you different. In 17, it says these are four kingdoms that shall come and they begin with medo persia and go to greek and roman and then the fourth one is the last uh days and the ten toes and out of those ten toes comes even one more kingdom he kind of brings it out here we're going to see that in revelation uh we're in revelation 17 9 and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So on one hand, there is a place on earth in Rome that calls itself the city of God, where the vicar of Christ sits on seven mountains, Rome. They have seven mountains in that city. But at the same time, there's seven kingdoms that he's going to liken it to. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings five are fallen. So God's telling John, who wrote this in 96 AD, that five of these kings have already passed, and there are two yet to come. So that's um, the, uh, the revived Holy Roman Empire, the United Nations, and, and these, uh, I guess it's in a sense, uh, what are we looking at? There are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. So that's Roman. So when he says one is, that's the Roman Empire. That means there's one more. There's the last kingdom that we're facing right now, the United Nations. And the other is not yet come. 
And when he cometh, that king, or that kingdom, that head, he must continue a short space. It'll be a very short-lived kingdom. <clears throat> it'll be seven years. And it'll end with destruction at the Armageddon. So it'll be very short. It tells you that. And it's going to begin, I believe, it's, it's already got the workings in line up, but it's going to really begin when we get raptured. When we get caught out of this world, then there will be these ten kings that will know that their time is short. <clears throat> and there are seven kings, five are fallen, that's before John. One is, that's the Roman, and the other is not yet come. That's the, the, the United Nations kingdom. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Well, we're reading that back here in Daniel. Out of these ten will come three, and from those three, they'll come the Antichrist. Let's go back to Daniel. We can go back to Revelation. Keep your finger there. Verse 20, uh, where are we at? Verse uh, 8. I considered the horns, so there's ten of them. And behold, there came up among them another little horn. That's the Antichrist. So that's the eighth. He's going to have his power for a very short time before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So he's going to have three countries, three kings, give him his power. I thought about it. I don't know exactly who they are, but it might be Germany, France, and Italy. Um, when you think about World War II, um, you know, uh, Hitler joined with Italy, with Mussolini. Um, maybe if they had France on their side, they would have done it. But the French didn't aid Hitler. They had the underground. And so, I mean, that, under the Holy Roman Empire, that was the three strong countries. Germany, Italy, and France. So there's some, you know, what you call satellites like Spain and Belgium and England. But the core of Europe would be those three countries. I don't know who the ten are. It could be Belgium, Spain, England. Um, it's hard to say uh, who the ten are, Greece. But they're going to join these ten kings of Europe, and out of them, three of them are going to be the most powerful, and they're going to give their power to the Antichrist. That's what it's saying here. That's what I'm getting from this verse. Look at verse 8. I considered the horns, ten of them. Those are the ten toes. And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom were, there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. <clears throat> so the Antichrist is going to be a great speaker. He's going to be an orator. He's going to come along speaking what? Peace and safety. He's going to put the world at ease and say we need world control. We need to put an end to this disappearing of people. <laughs> we need to put an end to this dearth of famine, and we need to have everybody take a mark. And that mark will be able to control everybody, and everybody will be in line, and there'll be no outside controls. We need to have unity and one world power, like Nebuchadnezzar, like Medo Persian, Darius and Cyrus, like Alexander, and like the, 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 Z, uh, the, the Caesars, uh, or con, you know, under Constant, uh, Constantine. One world power. And so he'll convince the world to do that. And the, the way they'll do that is they'll give their power to this Antichrist. Um, and the whole world will have to take the mark. And so that's what this is speaking of, speaking great things. And so now 9 tells you how it ends. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Now I think about those thrones, it's going to be 10 kings, so that's obvious that it's the 10 kings and their power united are going to be destroyed. But there's also... Somebody being cast down at that time in Revelation 12. Let's go there. Revelation 12, 7. When you look at this word cast down. Look at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So the prince of the power of the air, the spirit's going to come down to the sea. And it's, going to, it's striving against Michael. 
and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, down. And his angels were cast out with him. So there's an illusion there, very clearly, I think, that this throne, too, is going to be cast down. Satan's losing his power. And he knows his hour is short. He knows his time is short. And so he does all he can to destroy the, the holy ones, the Jews, and go after uh, the righteous in that time. And that's going to be their judgment. That's going to be Israel's judgment. And they're going to go through the uh, Jacob's troubles. And so here we have uh, Jesus showing up, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. That's Christ in the millennium. So this is a millennial passage. It's not the great white throne. You're going to see a, a verse at the end of the verse. It sounds like it could be the great white throne at the end of verse 10. It says the books were opened. That's very, very, uh, you know, what is the word? Renaissance. There's a sound of, hey, that's the great white throne because it says the books were opened and the dead were judged. But the context here is his kingdom being set up as he puts down these ten kings at the end of the tribulation. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit. That's him reigning for a thousand years. Whose garment was white as snow and his hair, the hair of his head like the pure wool. That's a picture of Christ in Revelation chapter 1. You read that there, he sees the same thing. Go there, Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man. Notice that. We're going to see that very shortly. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps of the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. They did. They went to hell. And his voice was as the sound of many waters. So now, and that might, I don't know if that's an alluding to when Christ speaks, every language will be able to understand him. Because <laughs> you've got to think, in the millennium, everybody has different languages, but his voice, boy, when he speaks, everyone will understand him as they speak. And so um, here, it, it says in uh, verse 10, uh, well, verse 9, And his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I believe this there, in this context... It can allude to both the great white throne, but it's more so the judgment of the nations that begins at the beginning of the millennium. He's going to judge those people at that time. Plus, the Israel is going to come up, I believe, at the end of the tribulation out of the tombs. And they're going to stand before God, 10,000 times 10,000, millions and millions. When you multiply them numbers, it says, thousand, thousands, Mishra, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. I don't know if, if that's a, I guess that's a million, 10,000? No, 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 it's more than that. <laughs> that's a lot. It's 100 million? So a thousand thousand is a million. So 10 times 10. Hey, Brother Joel, you, you're still teaching, aren't you? <laughs> that's 100 million, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's 100 million, but somebody can get a calculator out. But that's 10,000 times 10,000. A thousand times a thousand is a million. And ten times ten is a hundred. So that's a hundred million. And so they're standing before him now. And uh, the books are open. So God's always going to open the books. I believe at the, even at the judgment seat of Christ, the books will be open too. And so there's different judgments going on. You've got to remember your judgments as you study your Bible. There's a judgment seat of Christ. The Christians get caught up to heaven. And we're being judged up there. There's a judgment on earth. God's judging the Jews. They're paying for their sins, and they're going to make an end of iniquity. And then they go through the tribulation. Then there's a judgment of the nations immediately after those days and the beginning of the millennium. And then a thousand years later, there's going to be a great white throne judgment. So there's several judgments going on. And the, he's sitting on a throne on earth here. Verse 11, I beheld 
then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. So he's bringing up what he said against God. And he remembers it. And God's going to destroy him here in Armageddon. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed. That's the Antichrist. In Revelation 19, uh, you're going to see him destroyed. 19 verse 20, I believe. The Antichrist and the, beast and the false prophet are cast into a lake of fire. So he sees this happen here in his vision. And that must have been some vision. Can you imagine seeing all this? The whole book of Revelation and all those kingdoms. And he sees these beasts coming up. And he sees their teeth. And he sees iron teeth. And he sees, uh, you know, the wind striving, strove upon the seas. Man, he can't, he just can, cannot even explain it. I imagine if you lived back there and you saw rockets and helicopters and and airplanes and cars and tanks. And you're living back when they had chariots and just, you know, they didn't have but swords and spears. And you're seeing all this stuff un, un, unfolding. We don't even imagine, you know. We, can you imagine seeing back then an atomic bomb going off and all the destruction? Just now we can comprehend it because it's can somewhat, we've been seeing it on TV. But man, he's getting his visions of the whole period of man's from the, from about 5, what is that, 539 or 538 B.C. all the way up to 2000 and who knows what, 37. We don't know when the Lord's coming back, but it sure seems like we're on the door, doesn't it? we got China and Taiwan and Ukraine and Russia and Europe and, and Sodom and Gomorrah all around us. And man, how far can it go before God pulls the switch and he said that's it uh, and god does he says i had enough and there's times when god just says let it rain hell, brimstone hellfire and brimstone coming down and there's a point where god's going to say the nations have gathered against me and the time is right and the time is now israel's in their land israel's uh, got themselves judges and they have perverted themselves again and they got gay rights parades and they're doing all kinds of wickedness and the Lord says, I'm going to bring you through. I'm going to purify the sons of, e of uh, Jacob. And God's ready to do that. And so Daniel saw all those things. And he sees Christ sitting on the throne in the millennium. And, the, and that beast with great iron teeth and horrible, he just sees it destroyed. And that's the devil. That's the Antichrist. And he's, and he's rejoicing in verse 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. That's in Revelation. Let's turn there. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped the images these both were cast alive, their bodies, into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And that's what he sees. He sees that happen before John saw it. So back in Daniel 7, 11, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame, lake of fire. Verse 12, as concerning the rest of the beasts, this is an interesting verse. I couldn't, I can't quite, I think it means they get some of the Gentile nations still get to survive into the millennium. They had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So the way I, I could look at that is they're no longer under their own kingdoms. There's no Greek, Roman, Medo Persian, or Babylonian kingdoms. But the Gentiles of those nations who did not take the mark of the beast get to live. And for a season, that's a thousand years. And so that's what I'm seeing here. There's, there's some, uh, a good passage if you want to study what happens to those people in the tribulation. Do they all die? No. There's plenty of nations that will go through and they will bring up sacrifices. And the nations will, if they don't worship Jesus Christ, there will be no rain upon their land. And it says in Zechariah and other prophecies about that time. There'll be a temple. There'll be sacrifice. There'll be worship of Christ. And so, uh, so they, they are prolonged. <laughs> it's funny how it says a season. 
a million years is a pretty long season, right? <laughs> a day, but the Lord, a thousand years is, is one day, and one day is a thousand years. So it doesn't tell you. So the Bible is sometimes vague about times. They give their, it says they give their power for one hour to the beast. I don't believe it's 60 minutes, but it's saying it's a short period of time. Uh, the hour of power, you know, has come. And so you, you, when you study your Bibles, there are sometimes it's literal. I mean, it's an hour. Sometimes it's figurative. You have to really study the whole scriptures. And so I'm not sure if that's alluding, but I think it is verse 12 saying there's some people that were in those kingdoms that will continue into Christ's kingdom. Verse 13. Now you have the deity of Christ seen here because the Ancient of Days is spoken of again in the context here, it's the Father. Back in verse 9, it was the Son. The Ancient of Days did sit, that's Christ. But now here in verse 13, if you're a Jew, you say, I don't know if I believe that the Word became flesh, and I don't, I don't believe in two persons. Well, then you don't read your Old Testament either because you've got the Son of Man here, and, he's, and then you have the Ancient of Days, another person giving him his throne. Verse um, 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds, that's Christ, in heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So he came to the Father. But he's called the Ancient of Days back in verse 9. Both of them are the Ancient of Days, the Father and the Son. It's like Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. He said, how long have I been with thee? And thou hast not known the Father. I and my Father are one. Amen. So when you say the Ancient of Days, that's eternal God. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. Amen. And you say, well, I don't understand the Godhead. Nobody does. Amen. You're never going to figure out the power. I believe, though, that there are three in one. The Bible tells me so. And so uh, these three said, let us make man in our image. And so the Ancient of Days here is Christ. The Ancient of Days here is the Father. The Son of Man is Christ. He became a man. The Word became flesh. He said, Father, restore to me. Uh, he says, um, was it seven, John 17? We'll close here. John 17, verse 4. Jesus Christ is the Almighty God. He's the everlasting. There's no God. He is the Lord. There is one God. Not two, not three. He's one God. Three in one. Uh, what did I say? I just refreshed my memory here. Where? Oh, John 17. John 17. He did, you know, there's people fiddling around with this firstborn of every creature. They don't understand their Bible. He was not firstly, he wasn't created first. And we'll finish on this. He was, they are born from him. He created all things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, the Word. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And he is, that thing, these people, He's the firstborn from the dead, too. That means He triumphed over death. As a man in the body, yeah, He became, and He's firstborn. But He was never born in eternity. That's a, that's a heresy. Beware. There's people out there trying to say, God the Father created the Son. And he was the firstborn. Then they'll try to typify him as wisdom. You ever read that thing, I, wisdom? Uh, yeah, he talks about him being in the beginning ever. I uh, can't remember. That's in Proverbs. And so many times I've heard people say, that's Jesus Christ. No, it's not. Beware. It's wisdom. It doesn't say, I am Jesus Christ. It says, I, wisdom. Read that passage sometime because it's created. It's made. Um. Jesus Christ was never made. He was never, he never began to be. Amen? Without beginning of days, the Bible says in Hebrews. Christ does not have a father or mother. Or he doesn't have a beginning like that. He was never born. John chapter 17 says he had the glory before anything began. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the world was. He had the glory. He was with the Father. And before anything began to be, he already eternally existed. 
And so that's the Ancient of Days sitting upon the throne. One day he'll come back. All right, let's take a break right there. Amen.